Our next speaker is an award-winning researcher and passionate educator. She will update us on some insights, point out the challenges, but also bring out the tools for the transformation process, I hope. So from Oxford University, Dr. Bettina Witteben. There you are, Bettina, welcome. <laughs> Hello, yes. Um, Bet Bettina, before you yes. start, do you know of any other country in the world that uh, celebrates the Steel Day? I'm not aware of one, no. no. No, I'm very excited to be here. It's a pleasure and to be part of this and to see you all at work and see how it's all evolving, actually. So thank you. Thank you, Lydia. Yeah, um, I work at the interface of business strategy and climate policy, and I thought I had a pretty cool job until I just heard that presentation from Funda. I think my students still do a lot of the partying as well, but, um, uh, but it's not quite as, as um, um, yeah, cool like that at um, our university. But anyway, I'm based at the Environmental Change Institute, where I've also conducted this research that I'm presenting to you today. But I also teach at the Said Business School because I do uh, work between these two um, realms. So the uh, ECI is based at the School of Geography and the Environment, and then the Business School looking more at business strategy and organization theory, organization analysis. And um, I'm presenting to you today sort of an outside view of what you're doing. I've been watching what you're doing over the past two years from a distance. That's why it's so exciting for me to be here today. I met Eva Blixt from Jan Kontoret um, two years ago at a climate conference um, similar to the one that's taking place in Madrid right now as we speak. And um, ever since then, she, you know, she's really got me into this topic of the Swedish steel industry and we were also impressed when she presented on that at a side event that I chaired and I happened to chair the one that she was a panelist on so we got to know each other and it's so great to see the progress here. And um, what are we going to do though first is take a step back and sort of let this graph run in the background because you're all very well aware of what's happening and this is you know but uh, being based at the University of Oxford and having the natural science colleagues who are constantly working on this really you know, brings you back to this new reality we're facing with increased temperatures and um, all the e um, ecological impacts that that's having. Um, and of course, you know, looking at the audience, I'm sure you're all aware and you've all been watching this unfold over the last 20 years these temperatures rising, CO2 emissions um, coming to just unbelievable level. It's just mind boggling. But as a social scientist, and I'm management theorist, um, we look at also the economics and it's just really, you know, surprising that we haven't been as a co global community been able to cut emissions. And this is just energy related CO2 emissions. They've been going up and, and we know economic downturns are um, extremely good for the environment. But now we've come to a stage where actually right after an economic downturn, we're back on the path of increasing emissions. And although we've had a good run here where we've kept emissions um, plateauing, um, unfortunately that has not been kept up and we've now increased emissions again over the last couple of years. So for me as a researcher, the question is, you know, how do we deal with that as a global community and how are all aspects of the society dealing with this and well, how can we see change um, from this business as usual scenario? And, you know, the climate emergency has been announced by many different levels of government and, and private enterprise and also NGOs and, um, you know, possibly inspired one, uh, by one of your currently most famous exports, Greta Thunberg, who is just so good at putting these facts into, into these slogans and really powerful um, narrative. But what does that actually mean? So in the UK, for example, we've had the climate emergency um, declared at a local level, municipalities, even villages, also government level, and now, of course, the EU Parliament as well just declared the climate emergency. But what does it actually mean? So really, what we need to do is 
depart from the business as usual scenario and radically change the way we operate. It's nothing you know, more impactful than that. And um, of course, the climate emergency is a large scale, wicked problem that we have to attack at all levels and um, all sectors. And most sectors, I mean private, public, civil sector, but also, of course, we know also the, the traditional sectors of the economy and across all time horizons. So we need to do something about it now, uh, in the near future, in the far future, and at all levels, here, there, and everywhere. So for me as a researcher, then I look at it as two phases of this strategic climate action taking phase. First, you need to sort of come up with what you're going to be doing, and this is a collective process of, of envisioning new ways of operating. And then, but then these ways have to actually be implemented and have to be effective too, right? Because otherwise it's just, it's just discourse. And what we find in the management literature, now that we've had some time to, to watch things unfold, is that sometimes businesses go back to business as usual scenarios after 10 years um, of operating just because they fall back into old habits. Um, so we need to find cases where this is not happening. So my research question is, I, I'm investigating the processes of strategic climate action that organizations employ to collectively discover new ways of operating in order to effectively accomplish the transition to zero carbon. So I'm, I'm looking at both. I'm looking at more in depth at the envisioning phase, but I want to also make sure that what comes out of that phase has impact and actually does change operations. At, a, at a, you know, a radical change at a high level. So I'm going to quickly go over a few case studies that I'm looking at. And, and of course, you're, you're right here. And um, I'm trying to look at different sectors at different levels of um, operations. And I'll start with the Paris Agreement, which you all know. And the negotiations are ongoing at the moment, of course. To us as organization theorists, we look at uh, governments as competitors in this field and they're sovereign, but then they have their own interests, but they're you know, trying to grap uh, grapple with this, this common goal. And the climate summits are what we call field configuring events where, where things can change in that um, duration of two weeks. Of course, there's a lot of things that go on outside of these climate summits, but it's interesting for us because we can observe in these two weeks. And what we find is, you know, there's this sort of traditional um, grappling, political grappling, and people trying to get others on board and, you know, trying to, um, you know, sort of uh, minimize dissent. Of course, it's by consensus, you have to have everyone on board. That's not always the case, but uh, theoretically, that's how it's supposed to be. Now, what's the success, though? I mean, we've just seen. The U.S. is leaving, for sure, now the Paris Agreement. And even the countries that are part of it, um, you know, they've all agreed on this goal of 1.5 degree, hopefully, and for sure, too. But you see that even the most ambitious pledges and targets are nowhere near the goals set by, by governments. So even though there is such an intensive negotiation going on, the, you know, the actual impact of the Paris Agreement is, uh, is sort of not, not that directly um, apparent. Taking it now to the very local level, in Oxford, at the city of Oxford, we had a citizen assembly. Let's see a show of hands who's heard of citizen assemblies. It's actually one of the demands of the, of the Extinction Rebellion in the UK, one of its three demands to have a citizens' assembly. It comes from the notion of the sortition movement, where the sortition movement proposes to um, change politics to actually replace politicians by citizens' assemblies. And citizens' assemblies are um, randomly selected participants that represent the demographic of an area. So in Oxford, they've gone ahead and um, assembled these 50 participants, and it's you know fairly random um, 
based on these criteria, they do need to represent the area. And, um, and they, they met for four days over two weekends. Um, they had 27 expert presenters from the community. If your community in, you know, includes the University of Oxford with IPCC lead authors presenting to you, that's pretty good for your citizen assembly. Um, but that's sort of how a citizen assembly works. Now, the success is yet to be seen because the assembly only just happened, but it heavily depends on how you're selecting the participant. It's supposed to be random, but obviously there's some self-selection because there's, you know, you need to provide some incentives. In this case, the participant received 300 pounds at the end of the sessions. And, um, you know, how are you going to design your workshops? who controls the information flows, who's actually presenting to these participants and how's the event facilitated. But mostly though, the main question is what happens with the recommendations after the assembly is finished? Because governments don't have to immediately take on the results, it's only a recommendation. So again, we're sort of one step removed from implementation here and when the citizen assembly finishes, maybe those 50 participants actually go off in their daily lives and, and know a lot more about climate, the climate crisis, but um, whether their recommendations and solutions are put into place is another question. So then I have the Swedish steel industry case. Thank you, thank you, because it's such a great success. And I'm not just here to congratulate you. I want to you know, make sure you keep working hard on this. On this. And Eva and I got together with Chris Batai from Canada, who is also, he was co-chairing the event with me when I, I met Eva, actually. Um, and um, we started writing up a paper that we've presented at the University of Oxford in September. Um, and what we found is there are basically three main aspects of the process. And that's leading to the successful transformation. And sorry about the um, bad graphic. I'm an academic. <laughs> you know, I have excuse for not having you know, super fancy graphics. Um, so basically, you have come up with this notion of societal value, which Eva tells me is sort of very, um, you know, based in the, the Swedish language and Swedish culture. But you've grappled with it through the co-creation process. You've come up with you know, real definition of what that means and how that can be implemented. But the social entrepreneurship of your encontrant, and I have no idea if I'm saying this right, um, and with the help of the Stockholm Environment Institute, that's what really enabled the co-creation process to make it possible. And what we're finding is that, you know, that these three factors really made the transformation successful. Um, so you have the concept um, that you know led you to to come up with this uh, no waste and no emissions by 2050. And I understand that the you know time horizon is quite far because it's steel industry. Other industries could use you know closer time frames. Although it's not that far. You know my daughter is nine. She'll be. 40 in 2050, so it's, that's, that's not too far off for her. Um, the, co the notion of co-creation, which originated in marketing, where people, instead of having focus groups um, talk about a, a new product, the focus groups actually came up with new ideas for a new product. That's also a very, um, a very powerful process because um, you bring together stakeholders but relevant stakeholders who then come up collectively with new ideas and therefore the knowledge created is very highly contextual and um, and these participants then own the idea and the point is that when the social entrepreneur leaves the room, the ideas are still there and when the participants go, they take the ideas with them and that's why it's so powerful. But it's the social entrepreneurship that makes that happen because you need to find the right participants. Whereas in the citizens' assembly, it's a randomized process and hopefully you find a balance of you know, representatives from the demographic group. 
Here, you really need to make sure you find the right participants. But when you do, you can build these strong relationships that, that have, you know, then instill this unique uh, commitment. That's possibly also an emotional commitment. We have a speaker later on, Emma, I think, who I, I'm really looking forward to that one to talk more about this. So I think there's a really big success story here. And I don't need to tell you about these because you know this better than I, I do. And um, sure, probably the SDGs compass should also be on here. Um, and um, we'll see how it evolves, you know. Um, but I think this combination of the three processes is really what, what made this so powerful. And I want to further develop this research agenda, which we call the Sustainable Industrial Ecosystems, because you work with companies along the supply chain um, and then also spread out to governments and, and looking at the context you work in. And um, so what we want to do is draw theoretical insights that can then be applied to other contexts, other industries, other places, that sort of thing. So I'm going to hand you back to Lydia. And the question I have for you, I don't know if you want to take that on, but I want to hear from you what you think about why it was possible for the Swedish steel industry to depart from the business as usual scenario so drastically. And more generally, how is it possible to overcome the barriers to climate action that we see in the world today? So. Yeah, I'd like to hear from you. Okay, uh, I'll, I'll explain this in Swedish for them. Yes. Jag tror det bästa är om ni kan prata med grannen bara någon minut så kan jag komma med mikrofonen och se vad, vad era, hur att era tankar går här. Men egentligen undrar jag Bettina här, hur har det varit möjligt för förståelindustrin att faktiskt byta eh, skiftet? Ni får hjälpa mig här om ni har någon annan engelska. Att gå in i det här med skiftet, eh, mentala skiftet eh, och hitta innovativa lösningar. Hur, 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 har, den, hur har det funkat? Eh, och mer generellt. Eh, hur kan man eh, komma över eventuella hinder för att va, eh, gå in i de här klimataktionerna? Är det rätt översatt? Tack Maja. Maja är min lite så här rättelse. Eh, kan ni prata ihop er med varandra bara så vi ser vad vi kan leverera till Bettina. Hon studerar den här industrin och ska ta med sig detta hem så att säga. Så några minuter med den som sitter bredvid så kommer jag med mikrofonen sen. Yes. <laughs> this is absolutely wonderful. Det här är ju underbart. Alltså det, att ni går igång så på detta är ju härligt, men det här är bara början. This is only the beginning. As I said before, Bettina is going back to Oxford, and I think she will be delighted to have some reflections from you, bring back to her continuous work. So, um, hands up. Any ideas? Yes. Oh, I'll take you. You're, you're closer. I'll come to you later yeah. on. Please tell us who you are. Yeah, I'm Arun, and uh, I'm from KDH. I'm doing my material science here. Uh, master's in material science. Before coming... Uh, I worked in the steel industry back in India for four, four and a half years. So I can roughly say, answer the first question because what I felt for the, this is my second year. So I, like, a great credit should go to Swedish steel industries because their relationship with students is so good. Like, uh, all the, the, the steel industries come towards the research institutes and they, and they bring relationship with students. And the research starts from students. So there is no less innovative uh, ideas. There are always new innovative ideas. And it's also that the steel industries take those ideas and then they work on it and they implement it. So for, for me, in the, on, the, on, the, on the other hand, it's, it's less of student involvement. And uh, the summary is Swedish steel industries have more research-oriented approach, and uh, it's so, a land so of innovation. So everyone is happy? No obstacles? Everything uh, is fine? I can answer the first question. The second question should be taken by the Swedish steel industry. Oh, so okay, yeah. okay. <laughs> Could I just ask, um, 
is that specific to the steel industry in Sweden, or is that something that the Swedish, uh, no. you would say, is sort of a cultural Swedish thing, or is yeah. it a steel industry thing? Th that's a good question, because uh, uh, they say Sweden is a land of innovation for a reason. And uh, doing my master's, I could realize that it is a land of innovation and mm -hmm. ideas. And uh, it's, it's society. It's, I would say, uh, it's the approach. Uh, the Swedish approach, like the mm. or the culture. New word, the Swedish <laughs> approach. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Okay, Bettina, I continue. Say gärna vilka ni är. Det hjälper Bettina, tror jag också. Varsågod. Ja, det här är Patrik och Benny. Vi har kokat ihop lite här. Uh, they have I've, cooked I've, something. Yeah, they okay, I will take it in English. Sorry, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Patrick and Benny. Uh, and we facilitate creates for create the future for Jan Konturet and we work with several of these companies here. I'm not from the steel industry, but I think the steel industry and many industries in Sweden has a long tradition of innovation. But what has happened is that they have changed focus to take on this challenge. So to some extent it's business as usual, but it's a new goal new uh -huh. things. And why are we fairly good at this? Because we assume trust. And that lowers the cost of innovation transactions. And there are research studies done on this. So we have a tradition of innovation. And there are both trust and quite a lot of transparency between the different parties. That is not so usual everywhere in the world. So. That's the answer, maybe, part of first question. So can I just um, come back here? And um, so if this is so unique, but a lot of the companies have, you know, foreign owners, foreign investment. Um, you know, we see foreigners coming here to study and being drawn into this. How much then is it still the culture? Is it? Are there certain processes that happen to make that possible? I Let's think trust. you heard a little from the first person who answered. If you get involved in sort of this tradition or the Swedish approach, I knew a lot of students at many universities come from foreign countries who are not citizens here, who get funding, who get support because they have good ideas. Because we are a small country who is very, very export dependent, and we have been that for many hundred years. So we are a small giant, maybe. <laughs> okay. Great. And I'm proud of the steel industry because the work they have done the last like 10 years is amazing. I yes. No Absolutely. one is talking about the second question, though. <laughs> uh, no, they will to do that. Yeah, involve yeah. the really young people because they don't do green badging. They think circular economy, they think environment Absolutely. from the first mm. minute. Mm. How do we, you involve young people? We use it in Create the Future, where we have multidisciplinary student teams, and sometimes they really amaze the industry what they come up with. Mm. And that's for a one-day workshop. Mm. Anyone else? Någon mer som kan addera? Titta här, längst fram, vad härligt. Glöm inte att säga vem du är och var du jobbar. Varsågod. Um, Anna Douglas, I work for the region uh, of Gävleborg and formerly for the Swedish steel industry as well. Um, I am an immigrant to Sweden and uh, understand all that's been said before about the innovation and the culture. I think it's fantastic here. Uh, I want to answer the second question, which is, come to Jävleborg. We're going to try something new. <laughs> uh, we're going to overcome the barriers. I am the project manager for a transition lab or a challenge lab together with Professor John Holmberg from Chalmers. Nu får du ställa dig upp så folk ser vem du är. Så här ser hon ut ifall vi pratar mer. Yes. So we're doing a, a challenge lab uh, about the, ch the climate and energy challenge that we have in our region with our industries. Uh, so come, uh, take part. We want to innovate together and collaborate. So we'll find the actual solutions. Bettina, do you have any questions? Yeah, how are we going to export this model 
to other <laughs> countries <laughs> and other contexts. Well, I come from Edinburgh where they learn cloning first, so maybe we can clone some people. <laughs> 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 so, cloning. Cloning, next, next topic. I, I was joking, I was joking. <laughs> Bettina, reactions. Shall we try another one? Har vi någon mer som, som vill säga någonting kring detta? Titta där. Säg vem du är, du snäll. Uh, my name is Magnus Pettersson. I'm coming from a small Swedish steel producer. And I think there is one important aspect that hasn't been mentioned. Uh, the Swedish steel industry is a very niche market-based, which means that we are not competing with each other. And that provides a giant incentive for cooperation between steel companies. And that's why we can sort of agree upon a long-term goal and actually start delivering on parts of it from each company. And I'd like to deliver also on the barriers, because the barriers are very simple. If it doesn't pay off, eventually we will go back to business as usual. It needs to pay off, it needs to be rewarded on the market. But we will be quite resilient, I would guess, for a number of years, but somewhere down the line, it will have to pay off. And when you say pay off, cannot be shifted, like the pay off actually be um, substantially different. You know, when investors are looking for disclosure of carbon emissions, that the pay off is not simply a financial pay off, but also pay off in other dimensions, do you think? Well, in theory, yes, but at the end of the line, the payoff in terms of goodwill or uh, incentives or whatever it is needs to pay back in money because somewhere our owners invested money into this. and Money has to return. Sooner or later, money has to return. Otherwise, the business is not sustainable. Right. And sustainability in this matter will suddenly be much more than only the obvious sustainable business. Comments, Bettina? Um, yeah, well, it's all very interesting. I'm trying to dissect what it is that's Swedish and what it is that's, you know, um, sort of more the capitalist system that just functions the way it functions and rewards certain actions. And um, so it's all very insightful to hear from you. And please do get in touch also. Um, my coordinates should be somewhere, or you can reach me through, through Jan Kontoret. Bettina, before you yeah. end uh, okay. or round up, uh, I think we have another uh, right. guest who wants yeah. to say, who are you? Joram Björkman, uh, Sunmic Materials Technology. Uh, I want to continue on your uh, elaboration, I think. And that will also create followers. Uh, and I don't see a conflict by sort of other kind of values and financial values. I think they will go hand in hand. And just imagine uh, the business proposition of having the first fossil-free steel. I mean, uh, part of this is, of course, Swedish technology. I think we are leaders in many cases, but also business entrepreneurs. Th th this is a fantastic business case, I think. Uh, anyway, Bettina, you see, we have a lot of uh, um, um, ideas, we. These people have a lot of ideas. Yeah. Uh, you will bring it back and we know where to find you. And you yes. will, uh, of course, uh, hold the line uh, constantly between the steel <laughs> industry and Oxford University, yeah. I hope. Uh, yes, I will. Yes. Thank you very much for your input. And I'll be watching you from a distance. <laughs> <laughs> well. Thank, Thank you, Bettina. You. Thank you very much. <laughs>